man of no knowledge assumes that he knows everything if he lives his whole life in a little corner of the world. But this he does not know. What answers he needs if people confront him with questions. Only the one who wanders the wide world and makes his way through much knows what kind of mind each man is master of. He knows what knowing is. These are quotations from the Havamal, or words of the High One, a collection of proverbs from the Old Norse uh, poetic Edda, uh, a medieval text that collects uh, myths, heroic legends, and uh, aphorisms like this from uh, the ancient Scandinavia and other areas of, the, of Northern Europe. This particular part of the Poetic Edda, the Havamal, is full of advice about how to live and uh, interact in the world of the uh, medieval Norse uh, during the Viking era and before during the time of the Great Migrations. Uh, it distinguishes between intelligent behavior and unintelligent behavior. You know, what, is, what counts as wisdom? Uh, how to uh, sort of be defensive and defend yourself from attackers, but at the same time be open uh, you know, make new alliances, exchange gifts, uh, and feel at home in the world. Uh, another one says, a man of no knowledge when he mingles with people had best say little. No one knows that he has no knowledge unless he talks too much. A man who knows nothing does not even know that he's talking too much. On the other hand, reticent uh, and reflective must a ruler's child be, and he must be brave in battle. Genial and merry must every man be until he encounters death. And of course this advice given during a harsh time in history and also a harsh part of the world to live in uh, is very much aware that uh, life is short, uh, everything that grows eventually dies, and these two proverbs address that by saying cattle die, and cattle were a form of wealth. You know, obviously gold is a source of wealth, but uh, References to cattle usually mean references to personal wealth in this uh, pastoral culture. Cattle die, kinsmen die, one dies oneself just the same. But the fame of renown never dies for anyone who earns himself that excellence. Cattle die, kinsmen die, one dies oneself just the same. I know one thing that never dies, judgment on every man dead. In other words, uh, Everything you earn in your life, you'll lose. Uh, your wealth, your uh, family, uh, and, you, uh, and your own life. But if you do something worth remembering, people will remember you, and that, if you're lucky, will never die. That should sound familiar. That is the, uh, the concept of kleos amphthaton, uh, the, the Greek thing that uh, Achilles and the other uh, Achaeans were fighting for. Uh, they weren't even the ones that knew they wouldn't survive the, the Trojan War, they wanted to be remembered and potentially remembered forever. And that word Kleos Amphitan it shows up also in uh, ancient Indian uh, scriptures, the Vedas, uh, which indicates it's a very, very ancient concept in the Indo-European culture and is carried into three diff very different branches of Indo-European culture. That is uh, ancient uh, Indian culture, ancient Greek culture, and ancient Norse culture. So the aphorisms, the, uh, the advice, as well as potentially the narratives and the myths that are a part of the Poetic Edda and some of these other uh, texts that uh, we're gonna look at, uh, seem to have at least some elements that go back uh, centuries, but uh, even potentially thousands of years. This work, this particular work, the Havamal, it's the, the title means words of the High One, and it, uh, the High One in this case is uh, Odin. It's attributed to the chief of the Norse gods, uh, Odin, who the, the Anglo-Saxons remembered as Wotan, uh, ancient Goths remembered as Wutanas. Uh, there are several other names because he was a, uh, a god that was recognized throughout the Germanic world even before the Viking Age. And he frequently uh, shows up in the narratives. Now, there are works in the Poetic Edda and some of the other Old Norse works that are uh, about Odin uh, going along on his quest for wisdom or quest for understanding. Uh, he also knew the, the prophecy that the, the gods of uh, Valhalla would eventually be destroyed by the frost giants and the fire giants uh, at Ragnarok, the, the, the doom of the gods. 
and he was always trying to find a way to put off that fate, uh, to take care of uh, you know his own children, the the gods, um, and uh, he was frequently going about the world in disguise. He's frequently described as having uh, put on this cloud gray cloak and wearing a, a broad brimmed hat that he can pull down over uh, his face a little bit to hide the fact that he's missing an eye because he gave up that eye as a, a sacrifice to uh, this being named Mimir uh, in order for Mimir to allow him to drink from the well of knowledge, this, this well whose waters uh, give you access to uh, prophecy and to knowledge of the world beyond. And this character, Mimir, sounds a lot like Enki. Remember the, the beliefs about the, the water underneath the earth that the ancient Mesopotamians had. But Odin is a very unique god. He's frequently represented uh, in, in modern culture, like in the, the Thor movies with Anthony Hopkins playing him. He looks just like a, another version of Zeus, except he has wings on his helmet. Uh, he looks like the, the Roman, Greek, Jupiter, or Zeus. Uh, and even in uh, pictures uh, f drawn of him in the, the 19th century, uh, when a lot of Norse mythology was becoming very popular, especially in Europe, uh, he's represented in much the same uh, way that uh, Zeus would be represented. But he's very different. He's, uh, he's not the sort of all-confident, all-powerful, um, domineering figure. He's always traveling in disguise, he's always trying to learn something, and he's frequently trying to help his favorite humans uh, achieve their goals. And in, uh, in all these circumstances, he goes in disguise. He doesn't want to be recognized. He changes his name in this um, uh, another text from the Poetic Edda called Grimnismal, uh, which is the sayings of Grimnir. Uh, he says, my name is Grim, when someone asks him, which means dark. Uh, my name is Gangleri, which means wanderer. Herian, which is warrior. Hjalmberi, which is helm bearer. Uh, Thek, you know, clever, uh, because this is his characteristic. He's uh, frequently referred to uh, by names like Truth Finder, that's the Sangatal, uh, but also terms which refer to his uh, role as the, uh, the god of warfare, or one of the gods of warfare. Uh, there are terms for the Norse gods like Valtivar, which mean uh, gods of war, so they're all sort of gods of war, but uh, Odin is the sort of strategic one. Um, and of course, he shows up in disguise in the work that I asked you to read for uh, this unit, which is the saga of Rolf Kraki. Uh, he shows up as the farmer in disguise named Hrani. Uh, in fact, he shows up three times. Uh, each time to sort of test King Rolf and his men, uh, and each time he uh, exposes them to some, uh, some difficulty, some pain, some uh, uh, test of their uh, fortitude. And he always tells Rolf, just you and your 12 champions, you are the only ones who should go to face King Adels. Uh, if the rest of these go, then they'll be defeated and they'll drag you down with them. And so he's, he's testing King Rolf because he wants to prepare him for this uh, confrontation that he's gonna have with this magic user, uh, King Adels. And, uh, and he offers uh, King Rolf uh, a, a sword and a, a coat of mail and a shield and uh, this is something that he does frequently with uh, heroes in Old Norse mythology. He'll give them uh, some a special weapon, although it doesn't always look like much, which is the case in uh, Hrolf's saga, and Hrolf rejects it, and that uh, is where he loses Odin's favor, and so Odin doesn't help him in the upcoming battle with the army of Queen Skuld. But of all the things that Odin is known for, the most interesting for uh, our purposes here in a literature class would be that he was attributed the uh, invention of runes. Now, of course, uh, the ancient Nor or the, the medieval Norse and the uh, Anglo-Saxons and the other Germanic tribes of Northern Europe eventually got writing from the Romans, but they had a form of writing which was best designed for carving. It could be carved on pieces of wood, it could be inscribed on rings and medallions, it could have uh, magical properties, you know, it could be some sort of magic spell that you carry around on a, a medallion around your neck that has some charm to protect you or to keep you from getting lost or something like that. Uh, this uh, uh, piece of wood at the bottom has a love poem on it. Um, but it could also be used to commemorate someone who had uh, passed on. Uh, in this case, uh, the rune stone on the left is a uh, a stone that was erected on the uh, island of Gotland 
uh, which is this island off the coast of Sweden. And as you might have already guessed because of what I've mentioned about the Geats and the Goths and the Gouts in uh, uh, Hrolf Saga, uh, Gotland is named after these people that uh, were, uh, you know, one branch of which would go down and eventually conquer uh, Rome, another branch of which would remain there and be the people of Beowulf. Uh, but there's, this stone was erected in Gotland and it's, uh, the runes say that it was erected for a man named Ram. And Ram traveled, quote, far and wide in Ifor. And Ifor is a name for uh, a region that you pass through when you take this Dnieper River route. And I mentioned how the, uh, the ancient Norse were able to find these river routes where they would uh, sail from the Baltic Sea up a river, uh, up into the mountains, and then find a lake or uh, sometimes find a way to uh, carry their ships over a mountain or uh, from the headwaters of one river that flowed uh, west to the, the headwaters of a river that flowed south down to the Black Sea. And that's what this region was that this man named Ram traveled in. And so whatever happened to him, uh, someone put this stone up so that people would remember uh, potentially forever. Uh, you know, he would have fame that lived on beyond him, uh, uh, even though he and you know everything he uh, earned by the trading on that, that route. Uh, all of that stuff passes away, but this rune stone is there to try to make that uh, quote from the Havamal come true, which is you know to be remembered forever, to have that kleos forever. Uh, and he is remembered, if for nothing else, than the fact that he was one of those who was able to travel these river routes from the Baltic Sea down to the Black Sea. And these runes that allowed this were attributed to Odin. Uh, and we can learn a lot about uh, the, the Norse from what they wrote on these runes before they had access to Roman uh, letters and uh, writing on parchment with ink. Uh, the problem is the runes are good for carving, but they're not so great for writing long narratives or any, any other long text. So most of what the, the more developed knowledge we have, the longer narratives, the poetry, the uh, longer prose that we have, is written down on parchment, which is uh, calfskin or sheepskin that's been stretched out and uh, because there's no paper at this time. They uh, don't yet have the technology to take wood pulp and, and turn it into paper. So each of these uh, pages has to be written on leather. Uh, that means it's uh, very expensive. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into that uh, more in a, in a later lecture. But uh, the, the writing, uh, most of what we know uh, is written on these pages. Now keep in mind writing traveled with the spread of Christianity. It spread, this is how Roman technology and Roman connections uh, spread into Northern Europe. And that means that by the time these things are being written down, they're being written down after uh, people no longer believe in the, the old myths about Odin and, and others. Uh, it also, uh, these most of this writing that we have that tells us what the uh, the medieval and, and ancient Norse believed uh, was not written in uh, Scandinavia, it was written in Iceland, which, which was at that time seemed like the, the edge of the world. Uh, but the Icelanders wrote a lot. They recorded a lot of their uh, ancient cultural traditions, the old stories that people had told in the oral tradition, uh, because they wanted to preserve these old stories, and these old poems, and uh, this sort of uh, artistic knowledge. And they wrote several different kinds of texts. Uh, so the Havamal that uh, produced those proverbs that I, I read at the beginning, and that's part of the, the Eddas. So there's two Eddas, the Younger Edda, uh, which is also called Snorri's Edda, or the Prose Edda. Uh, that's an Edda written uh, that we have an author that we know, his name is Snorri Sturluson. And he deliberately wanted to save as much of, of oral tradition, of poetic tradition as he can. He even wrote, as part of that uh, Younger Edda, uh, he wrote uh, uh, a book about uh, how to recognize references to old mythological stories. So if you heard someone say that you were uh, reaping the harvest on the fierce plain or fierce valor, 
you would know, oh, uh, the, the harvest on the Fierce Valor, that's the, the, the plane where King Hrolf Kraki threw down gold uh, while he was uh, riding away from King Adel's army, and King Adel's army stopped to reach down to pick up the gold, so they were, it was as if they were harvesting uh, these uh, seeds that uh, King Hrolf had planted. Well, Snorri Sturluson wanted to write uh, a text that would uh, help explain a lot of these old references before they were forgotten. Uh, that was the younger Edda. The, the elder Edda, the older uh, Edda, was, is called the Poetic Edda. And that one was written a little bit before uh, Snorri's time. And it contains the, the Havamal. It contains a lot of other stories about uh, the gods and the, the heroes that uh, the, the Icelanders uh, had stories about uh, hundreds of years before. Uh, similar to that are a, a type of saga, and this is where we get the word saga from the Icelanders. Uh, a saga was a story not just about one person, uh, but a, usually about an entire family. Uh, and uh, if you go back and read the beginning of Hrolf's saga, you'll see that uh, most of the beginning is not about Rolf at all. It's about uh, his father and even his grandfather. Uh, and this is pretty common in most Icelandic sagas. It starts several generations before the, the, the main hero or the main protagonist. But these sagas uh, took different forms. Uh, one type of saga was called the Fornaldr Sogur, or the, uh, the songs of the legendary times. Uh, these were uh, sagas about uh, mythical uh, people. Uh, frequently the gods show up in these uh, ancient sagas. Uh, and they're people who lived either during the Viking Age or even before that, during the, the time of the Great Migrations, uh, shortly before and then shortly after the fall of Rome. Uh, this is what uh, uh, Rolf Kraki's saga is. It's one of the legendary sagas. Another one of the most famous uh, legendary sagas is called the Volsung Saga. It's about uh, this uh, uh, a dragon slayer named Sigurd, uh, but it starts even before that with his uh, father, who's named Sigmund. Uh, this is what uh, Richard Wagner's operas uh, about the, the, the ring cycle. Uh, if you've ever heard The Ride of the Valkyries, uh, this is from that opera, and it's about the story of uh, the Volsung saga. Uh, another type of saga is the King's Sagas, and these are stories about the kings of Norway and of sometimes of Sweden and of Denmark. Uh, and these are being written in Iceland, which is a democracy. They were still very interested in the histories of the kings that had come before them. And then there are the most famous, the ones you can find the most examples of if you, you know, go to Amazon.com or go to the bookstore and, and want to buy some Icelandic sagas. Mostly what you'll find are the sagas of the Icelanders themselves. And these are stories about uh, the people who actually settled uh, Iceland. Uh, there's also a type of saga called the Night Saga or the Ritter Saga. Uh, and that is very much like literature about King Arthur or about Charlemagne or uh, other uh, figures that uh, show up in literature from the uh, 1300s, 1400s, and after that. And Iceland is a very interesting place, has a very interesting history. Uh, until 874, when the first permanent settler, uh, Ingolfur Arnarson, showed up, uh, sailed from Norway in order to settle there, uh, there was no native population. This is one of the few places we can say that Europeans did not take away from someone else. Um, and most of the people that settled there in the uh, the, the 10th century, you know, the 900s, they didn't necessarily go there because they wanted to go there. They uh, went there because they were trying to escape from the new king of Norway. And Norway had not had a, a, a national king until that point, until a, a guy named Harold Fairhair uh, or Finehair uh, decided he needed to conquer every single small chiefdom and, and small kingdom in Norway. And he was very brutal. Anyone who did not submit to his authority, uh, you know, he would send his armies to attack and, and, and wipe out. So a lot of people, in order to maintain their autonomy, ma maintain their independence, uh, sailed from uh, Norway to this newly discovered place, uh, Iceland. And once they were there, uh, they had to deal with you know, very difficult climate. Uh, this is a satellite photo that was actually taken during the summertime. And all that white you see is snow on uh, glaciers. Uh, the Myrdalsjökull, which is the uh, or Myrdals glacier, uh, is that largest one on the bottom right, and that is uh, is, is was and, and still is the largest glacier in the world. Uh, of course, all of these glaciers were much larger uh, a thousand years ago when the uh, when Iceland was first settled. Uh, and that meant that if you go there in the summertime, it's it's uh, very 
uh, high alt or high latitude, so it's up around the 66th uh, parallel, uh, 66 degrees north, and that means in the summertime there is a lot of sunshine. Uh, it's you can watch the sun go all the way around the horizon and sort of dip below it just a little bit and then come back up and never really set. Uh, but that also means that during the winter time there is a lot of darkness and there's really not much to do outside. It's too cold and it's too dark to, to go do anything and this seems to be why the Icelanders decided that the best thing to do with their time indoors was to write down, uh, for one thing to tell stories, but then to write those stories down because it did take a lot of resources and a lot of time uh, to write down what they wrote down. Uh, but this seems to be why it was Iceland, this sort of edge of the world uh, place rather than one of the more one of the wealthier or more highly populated uh, areas of northern Europe. These Scandinavians who uh, fled Harold Fairhair uh, fled the sort of uh, sort of tyranny uh, as they saw it. Uh, they learned from their experience, and because they wanted to maintain a certain level of autonomy, they founded the oldest parliamentary democracy, uh, which is. Uh, called the thing, which is makes it difficult to translate into English because everything in English is a thing. But uh, thing, or once uh, it became consolidated at this one particular uh, place, it uh, became called the all thing. And this is the oldest continuously functioning uh, parliamentary democracy in the world. It's been active for over a thousand years now. But while they're telling these stories, uh, the Icelanders uh, as I mentioned, there are the Icelandic sagas where they're telling stories about people who lived just a generation or two before them. But they're also telling stories or, and writing these stories down about uh, people who, Scandinavians who lived during the Viking Age, and they're looking even beyond that uh, to the period of the Great Migrations, which uh, was the time when you know the Goths came down and uh, you know, settled around the Black Sea and then eventually uh, moved west and conquered Rome and settled in uh, modern day Spain and France. Uh, this is the time when the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes are going from the Jutland Peninsula, which is the modern day nation of Denmark, uh, as well as northern Germany and uh, settling in uh, uh, the island of Britain. Uh, they have stories about uh, people that we know from history were were very much part of these great migrations. Uh, Attila the Hun shows up as a character in, in several uh, of the uh, legendary sagas. Uh, he's called Otli, and he seems to be remembered relatively favorably. The, he seems to be one of these great kings that uh, the uh, that the Icelanders admire centuries later. Uh, they didn't see him as the the scourge of God or something like that. They they saw him as somebody who was good at what he did, and what he did was uh, conquering other nations. Uh, but we should also keep in mind that the Ostrogoths, uh, who, who had Scandinavian connections, uh, they were just as likely to have joined with Attila as to uh, run into trouble with him. It was the Romans mostly, uh, and the, the native populations of southern Europe that really, for whom Attila was the, the threat, the bad guy. Uh, if you were a, a Visigoth or Ostrogoth and you know you had to decide between farming or joining up with this army that could ride across Europe and you know capture spoils of war, then you might uh, be more likely be a little bit more favorable to Attila. So Attila's remembered relatively uh, favorably. Uh, several other kings from uh, the the Ostrogoths and, and the Visigoths uh, who settled in northern Italy and, and in Gaul are remembered in uh, these later sagas. But then there are also the, the Scandinavians who did not travel around much during the Great Migration, uh, the ones who stayed in uh, the areas of, of modern day Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. And even though these populations didn't move around Europe at the same time every, everybody else was, they did have a lot to do. There were quite a few uh, characters or potentially historical people who uh, made quite a name for themselves just staying in the uh, region of S Scandinavia. Uh, I want to look at this map really quick just so we know uh, the, the major layout of Scandinavia. Uh, the, the modern nation of Norway does not exist yet, but the, uh, uh, your translation makes a reference to it. This is where uh, King Hring and uh, his son Bjorn and his grandson Bodvar Bjarki are, are from. Uh, and the, the way to describe these people would be as Norse, but then again, the word Norse refers to uh, the language spoken in uh, all of this area. So it, it may be confusing if I just said this is where the Norse were. But there's uh, Norway. This is where most of the settlers of Iceland uh, came from. Uh, 
Uh, but then there's also the Swedes, but I, I'm not gonna refer to where they live as Sweden because modern day Sweden includes uh, the, the area of the Gauts or the Goths or the Geats. Uh, and that is the, the southern part of the Swedish peninsula which was not considered uh, belonging to the Swedes at this time. Uh, the Swedes at this time were centered at the, uh, the area of Uppsala or, or Uppsala, which was uh, a relatively, for this region, uh, highly populated area. It was also an area of great religious significance. Uh, we know that there, were, uh, there was a, a large temple to the, uh, the, the Norse gods there and people would make pilgrimages to it frequently. Uh, in the saga, in Rolf Kraki's saga, this is where King Adels lives uh, with uh, Rolf Kraki's mother, uh, Irsa. Uh, and this is where Rolf has to take his men to go reclaim his inheritance that King Adels has uh, taken from him. Below that is the area of the, the Goths or the Goths, who are going to be remembered in Beowulf as the Geats. Now, I'm anglicizing that G. If in, uh, uh, in Old Norse, it would be Jots. And so you can sort of see how a pronunciation of yot and yot would uh, sort of blend into each other. Uh, it's the Anglo-Saxons that use the word yeats. And it's not exactly a Y sound, but it's not a G sound either. It's kind of the, uh, the a middle between those two. But for the, uh, to, to make things easier, I'm just going to refer to them as the gauts or the geats. Uh, and this island between the Jutland Peninsula of modern-day Denmark and the Swedish Peninsula, uh, this is where most of the action of Hrolf's saga takes place. This is where his great hall of Lidar is, uh, and the area around is called Lidar Guard. Uh, this island is the island of Zealand. Uh, it's uh, part of uh, the nation of Denmark today, but bear in mind that the Jutland Peninsula that's part of Denmark today isn't all inhabited by Danes. The, uh, there are people called Jutes there, there are people called, uh, well, the, the Angles are there from the, the central part of the, the Jutland Peninsula. The Danes themselves are mostly on the islands between the Jutland Peninsula and the uh, Swedish Peninsula. Uh, also in the far north is the area of Finnmark. Now that's not to be confused with modern day Finland, which is named after the same Finns, uh, but the, the boundaries are a little bit different. Uh, this area is mostly too cold, especially inland. It's, it's too cold for even the, the Norse to really want to settle it too much. Uh, the, the Norse are more preoccupied with uh, settling along the coast. But the people who do live there speak a very different language. It's not an Indo-European language. It's, uh, even though almost every language spoken in Europe uh, and in uh, Western Asia, uh, Russian, Hindi, uh, uh, Slavic uh, languages, all of these languages are Indo-European languages. Even though they sound very different than English or Spanish or French, they actually do have a lot in common. But uh, Finnish, uh, the, the language spoken by the Finns and the language spoken by the Sami people or the people frequently referred to as the Laps, uh, the, the text you read refers to them as the Laps. These are the people of Queen Vit or Vite, uh, the, the queen who curses Bjorn and turns him into a bear. Uh, she's one of these people and their language is completely different. It actually has more in common with uh, the, the people who live around the Arctic Circle in northern Russia. And King Rolf's saga, even though the manuscript that you read uh, of Rolf's saga wasn't actually written down until the 14th century, it has enough clear parallels to a lot of older works uh, that this indicates that it's, it contains a lot of very old narratives in it. Uh, it's maybe a compiled uh, individual narratives that were once separate. Uh, but what it does is actually uh, combine independent, what might have been independent narratives about independent heroes. Uh, for instance, Bodvar Bjarki is the subject of uh, other works of literature, uh, some of which we, we don't have anymore, like there's a poem called the, uh, the Bjarkamal, or the Lay of Bodvar Bjarki, which uh, is a poem that doesn't survive today, but it's, uh, there are references to it in works that do survive, and they uh, will give a little bit of uh, quotations from, uh, from that. So we know that there are other works about Bodvar Bjarki. Uh, there are other descriptions of this hero named Svipdagr, who is, uh, there, there's an entire section that I didn't ask you to read, but if you go back and just because you want to uh, read the entirety of uh, King Rolf's saga, you'll see that there's an entire section about Svipdyr. And uh, uh, King Rolf himself is uh, the subject of a, a very long uh, legendary and literary tradition. 
uh, we're going to see when we get to Beowulf that the uh, author of Beowulf presumes that you know who Rolf, or in, in Beowulf he's called Hrothulf, uh, he presumes that you know who he is. So uh, he, he doesn't really, you know, he makes references to things that haven't happened yet, but he assumes that you know those things are going to happen uh, because that's how famous King Hrolf was. And by putting these different narratives together, uh, whether or not these these individual heroes were all thought of as being part of Rolf's court or not uh, is uh, we'll, we'll never know. But what has happened here is something very similar to the the Arthurian legends, where all these different knights uh, seem to have been uh, heroes of their own uh, stories. Uh, and but, but those stories during the Middle Ages are combined, and instead of being individual heroes doing individual things, they're all brought together around King Arthur's Round Table. Well, the same thing is happening here with. Uh, King Rolf and his champions, Svipdag and uh, Bodvar Bjarki, uh, as well as uh, uh, some of the other people that are obliquely referred to, uh, and potentially uh, Hjalti, the, uh, the little guy that uh, uh, Bodvar sort of turns into a, a champion, uh, may have all had their independent uh, origins and independent narratives, but they've been compiled into this uh, singular narrative. And so this is kind of what makes it a saga. It's not just a, a very tight, compact story. Uh, it's, it's combining lots of different uh, narrative threads. And it's a good example of Old Norse literature for a lot of reasons. It contains a lot of common themes uh, and common motifs that you'll see if you read a lot of uh, Old Norse literature, especially the legendary sagas, but even to some extent some of the, the later sagas. Remember that a motif is a conventional situation or device, literary device, or an interest or an incident, especially one that serves as a recurrent or unifying element in a text. Uh, it can be an image, a symbol that we see over and over again, a particular type of character, an action, an idea, an object, a phrase. Uh, and some of these motifs are deliberate. They're, they're literary conventions. They're, they're put there because this is what the literature usually contains. But also there are some ideas that the, the Old Norse would have taken for granted that you know we may not be familiar with. Uh, the the first is the idea of a troll. Now, if you see you know fantasy movies, if you see the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, we play video games. You you have you maybe have an idea of a troll as like one particular uh, species of of monster that looks a particular way. They're always large and stupid, and but trolls in uh, Old Norse uh, narratives are almost anything that is unnatural and scary. Uh, so the first troll we meet, the first uh, uh, character described as a troll, was Queen Vit. Remember, Vit is the, the lap girl that marries a King Ring, and she's the one that uh, slaps Bjorn with a, uh, a wolfskin glove, and that curses him so that it turns him into a bear during the daytime. Uh, she also knows how to do other types of magic. She's described as a Maistus troll, which is a, you know, the the greatest of trolls or the scariest of trolls. Uh, but she's a woman, she's a, a, a human, she's a human that can you know perform magic, but she's still described with that word, troll. Uh, also we have this dragon or dragon-like monster. It's, it seems pretty clearly to be a dragon that attacks uh, the Hall of Flydar that, uh, that uh, Bodvar Bjarki has to kill. Uh, and uh, but that dragon is described uh, as a troll as well. Uh, we also have this uh, boar that attacks uh, when uh, Rolf and his men go to Uppsala. Uh, uh, this magical boar attacks them and uh, Rolf's dog, Agram, uh, is able to defeat him, but that boar is also described as a troll. And even uh, Rolf's uh, sister, uh, Queen Skuld, uh, is described as a troll because she's able to uh, perform magic. So a troll is just anything that's scary and anything that's you know sort of supernatural. It's not just one type of uh, monster. Uh, I mentioned the the laps and the fins. These are the people that you know have a very different culture, uh, and as I mentioned, they have a very different language than the Norse. The Norse could understand the Swedes and they could understand the Geats and they could understand the Danes, even though their language is kind of slightly different. Uh, they could even understand the, the Angles and Saxons on the continent, uh, but they couldn't understand the, the language of the Laps. Or, you know, uh, the, the, there's people that still uh, are around today, they refer to themselves as the Sami people. But that word Lap sort of indicates that these are a foreign people that the Norse just don't know that much about, and because they don't know that much about them, they're a bit afraid of them. They have these uh, uh, shamanic uh, r religions and practices and, and, and rituals that don't fit what the Norse understand, so they see, the Norse see them as being this sort of dangerous, magical people. Another element of 
particularly this story, but also the, the next uh, story and some of the other texts that we're going to read. The idea of a bear. We all know what a bear is uh, when there are references to uh, bears. It might seem sort of banal. It might seem like not that not interesting. Well, it's, it's a large and scary animal, so th I guess that's why it's uh, something that would be good to turn into, or uh, as, as we see a body of our Bjarki doing in the, uh, the final fight with Queen Skuld's army. But bears in the, the Arctic region, uh, in particular the, the brown bear, which uh, this map at the bottom is, uh, is the modern day range of the uh, Ursus Arctis. There's, there's a, an R missing there, but uh, the, uh, the brown bear has this uh, domain that extends around the world. The Indo-European word for bears wasn't originally bear or anything that sounds exactly like bear. It was something more like Arcus or Urx. And this is where the Latin Ursus comes from. So if you know the constellation Ursa Major, you know it's the big bear. Uh, well this Ursus or Arcus, this is where we uh, still have in English the word Arctic, which literally meant the bear's realm, uh, the, the realm of the Arcus. But notice that we don't call bears Arx or Urx or Ursus. Uh, that seems to be because there was this prohibition in these northern latitudes, even for Indo-European people, not to refer, refer to the bear directly. Uh, whether it's because you're afraid that you were, it was going to hear you if you were hunting it and you wanted to sneak up on it, because as we see uh, from the, the feast, uh, you know, where they eat Bjorn, uh, that, you know, people did eat bear meat. But also it's a, a predator and it's, it's the largest and, and scariest predator on land. So that might al also have been a reason not to say its name because it would hear you and, and follow you and, and hurt you. You might be, you know, uh, you know, you speak of the devil and the devil appears. Uh, but w whatever this reason was, it's clear that there was an ancient taboo against saying Arcus. Uh, instead, people would say something like the brown one. And that is where we get our word bear. Uh, and so most of the uh, uh, Germanic, uh, and, and English remembers a Germanic language, uh, most of the Germanic references to bear start with a B. Uh, and uh, that includes Bjorn, the character in Rolf's saga, who is the father of Bodvar Bjarki. Bjorn literally means bear. Uh, his wife is Bera, which uh, is the female bear. His son is Bodvar Bjarki, and the Bjarki part means little bear. And next time we're going to read, uh, in the next unit, we're going to read Beowulf. And Beowulf's name literally means be wolf. And there are a lot of things, a lot of ways to interpret this. But the one that seems the, the most obvious, if you think keep this taboo in mind, is I don't want to say the word Arcus. So I'm going to say that there's this animal that is like a wolf, but it breaks into beehives because we know bears like honey. Uh, so there's a, a, a clear possibility that Beowulf means, as bee wolf, means um, the wolf of the bees or, you know, the, the large wolf that uh, attacks beehives, which is actually a bear. We also have these berserks, and this is where we get the word berserk to, like, go crazy, is to, to go berserk. Uh, we have some of these uh, figures showing up in Hroth's saga, uh, and they're these sort of dangerous warriors that even King Hroth is, is afraid of. Uh, the word berserk means literally bear shirt. Uh, so they're uh, these warriors that wear the skin of bears as their only armor, or maybe not their only armor, but uh, they wear these bear skins and potentially, you know, bear claws and bear teeth, maybe even a bear skull. We see in some of these uh, ancient uh, metal works uh, these images of the, like uh, the one on the top right of this uh, guy carrying a spear. It's clearly a human, but there's this animal head on top of it. So either it's, uh, you know, an animal headed person or this is somebody wearing uh, uh, pr potentially a, a bear a skull on his head or it could be a wolf as well. There was a, a similar type of warrior, it was called an Ulf Hidnar, which is a, uh, someone wearing a wolf skin. But the association with a bear seems to have been a, a source of power, not just uh, you know something cool to wear on the battlefield, but a, a source of uh, supernatural power in their belief system. And that, all of the bear imagery, uh, the fact that one of the main characters in Rolf's saga, uh, and especially if we look at Bodvar Bjarki's uh, story independently, uh, it's uh, a guy named Little Bear, who's the son of a guy named Bear, and a woman named Bear. Uh, that, uh, in itself uh, might just seem like a story about a, a guy with bear characteristics. But there are other elements, uh, structural elements, of the story of uh, Bodvar Bjarki within Hroth's saga 
which connect that story to a very ancient story that's actually found all the way around the world, uh, literally you know, ar around the Arctic Circle uh, and in cultures that are connected to that. Uh, this is something I'm going to talk more about when we get to Beowulf and then read some excerpts from Greta's saga, which is another Icelandic saga. But there uh, is this tradition of uh, this bear's son tale in which uh, the son of a bear, sometimes somebody with bear characteristics him himself, sometimes just uh, the son of a bear, uh, has to fight a monster that nobody else can fight uh, that has been attacking the, the dwelling of, of humans. Another motif we see in a lot of Old Norse uh, narratives is uh, the representation of these weapons and, and other artifacts that are bound to the fates of particular individuals. So Bjorn, before he dies, sets up these three weapons for his th uh, three sons. Uh, he, he has this sword set aside for Bodvar, uh, he has this axe set aside for Thorir, and this uh, seax, or this you know large knife, uh, sort of a dagger, but it's also useful uh, as a knife. Uh, that he sets up for his son uh, Frothi, or Elk Frothi. Um, and only the, the ones for whom those weapons are uh, set aside, they're the only ones who can remove them where they're, they're wedged in the stone. This sounds obviously like the sword in the stone from Arthurian legend. Uh, which is not actually Excalibur. Excalibur is given to King Arthur by the Lady of the Lake. Uh, the sword in the stone is uh, mostly just used to show that Arthur is the, the one who's supposed to be king. Uh, not much gets made of that sword afterwards. But there are also other stories in uh, uh, Old Norse where sometimes the god Odin will show up and strike a sword into the middle of a tree. He does this in the Volsung Saga. He sticks a sword in a tree and he says, uh, you know, uh, the greatest warrior among you will be able to pull that sword out, and of course, all everyone tries it, but it's the last one, who's Sigmund, uh, who's the one who's able to pull it out. Um, this is true with weapons. It's also true with objects. We have uh, Bjorn's ring, which he uh, has under his arm when he's killed in bear form. Uh, Bera goes up and uh, you know asks King Ring if he can have the, the or she can have the ring, which is uh, under his arm. Uh, and that later becomes the token by which she can identify herself and more importantly identify Bodvar Bjarki as the son of Bjorn and therefore the grandson of King Ring. But these objects uh, are objects of, of special attention. Uh, their, their use is more than just their use value. Uh, they have either magical properties or something, but most importantly they have a narrative property. Uh, they're there for a reason to, uh, without them the narrative cannot move forward. And frequently this is uh, connected to identity. This proves someone's identity. This is a weapon that can only be used by this person with this identity. Uh, and sometimes they have almost sort of identities of their own, uh, almost personalities of their own. Uh, for instance, uh, Bodvar's sword will only be uh, uh, unsheathed three times and then uh, uh, it sort of, it, it decides, the sword itself seems to decide whether or not it's going to be uh, used on a particular occasion. Uh, there are several interactions uh, and descriptions of, of fighting in, uh, in Hrolf's saga, which are very common, they're very peculiar, they don't seem to make much sense, they seem to be guys just being jerks, uh, but they're very common in uh, Old Norse literature. And uh, one of these is uh, a situation where uh, two people who know each other, one person will go to visit the other, uh, but remain in disguise, refuse to show his identity, uh, and be a sort of threat to someone who's actually his friend. And uh, there's this sort of interaction, he's sort of testing his friend to see if his friend will uh, you know, show him hospitality uh, or, or something like that. And frequently this ends up with a, a fight uh, frequently what, what I'll call a flinch test, uh, you know, the, uh, the host will, you know, swing a weapon at the, the, the guest in disguise, and this is sort of an opportunity for the guest to show how unafraid he is that he's not going to flinch. Uh, we see this happen when, uh, first when Thorir uh, Houndsfoot goes to see his brother Elgfrothi when he's on his way uh, out of Norway, and we see this again when Bodvar Bjarki stops at Elgfrothi's uh, uh, dwelling and pulls his hood down over his uh, face and won't tell his own brother who he is uh, until they end up fighting and wrestling around. Uh, it's only then that he reveals himself. This sort of thing happens a lot. It, uh, and it seems to be just a way to sort of, you know, prove that it does, that you're not locked to your identity, that you're not depending on the, the kindness of others. You can take care of yourself. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, 
sort of poetic, and, and literally this is responding to a challenge or to a fight or uh, after you've won a fight, responding in poetic verse. We have uh, King Hroth do this several times. We have uh, Bodvar uh, do this after he fights with uh, his brother uh, Elgfrothi. Uh, he responds with, uh, uh, with poetry. And it's kind of hard to tell in your, uh, uh, the webpage uh, that, uh, that you read, but uh, frequently uh, in texts that, you know, if you buy Jesse Byock's book, which I highly recommend, uh, his uh, translation of it, which is a Penguin Classics, uh, uh, Byock will actually separate the lines of poetry so that you can see, um, uh, see the difference between just normal dialogue and a response in poetry. And there are some later uh, Viking heroes, uh, namely like Eil Skallagrimson, uh, who's a, a later uh, a sort of Viking Age uh, Icelandic hero that uh, has his own saga, and he is uh, very much a poet. He will respond to people who are threatening his life with poetry in the moment, right as he's about to draw a sword or to fight, or right after he's killed somebody, he'll respond with a few verses. Uh, and then sometimes when people ask him who he is, instead of saying his name, he'll uh, give a line of poetry. This is something that we may not associate uh, the, the idea of a warrior with the idea of a poet. But this is something, these are two elements that are combined in Odin. Odin is not just the god of the runes, but he's also the god of poetry. Uh, he actually went, uh, he had to uh, steal this uh, uh, elixir of poetry, this, the mead of poetry uh, from the giants uh, in order to bring that to uh, the gods in, uh, in Asgard. And poetry was very much something that he was uh, connected with. Now there was another god of poetry named Bragi, uh, but he seems to be somebody who was actually a, a, a poet who lived at some point in history that was later sort of deified uh, and, and made into a, a minor god. Uh, but Odin unites warfare and poetry, and those two things seem to really uh, be the two things that uh, every real you know, Norseman, every Viking was supposed to be uh, good at. And so we'll have, re we'll have a, a, a warrior in the middle of a fight break into poetry, and that's just considered totally normal. Uh, we also have the the duty of vengeance. The uh, if someone killed someone close to you, it was your duty to get revenge on that person. We see this when Bodvar wonders why no one has killed Queen Vit when uh, he finds out that she's the one that had his father Bjorn killed. He wonders why didn't Frodi Elk Frodi uh, go and kill her? It was his duty. He was the oldest. Why didn't Thorir go kill her? It was his duty. So when Bodvar goes to do that, he's uh, saying, that, you know, he's not just doing this because he's angry, he's doing this because it is his duty as Bjorn's son to kill the person who had Bjorn killed. Uh, but as you can imagine, if you uh, have to go get revenge on somebody else, and uh, somebody's going to have to get revenge on you for killing that person, and then somebody's going to have to get revenge on the person that killed you, that can escalate out of control and turn into, you know, uh, entire families, entire tribes, entire clans uh, fighting with each other over generations. And that is actually the, su the subject of most of the Icelandic family sagas. Uh, quite a few of them. And uh, most of the uh, legendary sagas as well. Uh, it, each one of these, you know, something may start with an insult and the insult may result in a punch and the punch results in a, a, a stab and the stab kills somebody and that uh, means that somebody has to kill that guy but then three people will uh, be involved with taking revenge and that means another five people will have to kill the three people and it just gets bigger and bigger. Uh, so frequently uh, uh, these sagas will go on until something happens where the two sides are reconciled or more, more likely they just uh, there's not really much left of the the, the groups, and uh, people will just leave the area and travel away, and, and that's the end of it. Uh, one way to end the blood feud potentially before it, it starts was to pay uh, what the Anglo-Saxons called weregild, which is gold for a man or man gold, uh, where uh, you have a set price on an individual, and if you kill him, uh, either somebody's going to kill you or you have to pay this uh, set price for that person. And usually this, uh, this amount will be set depending on how high ranking you were in society. Uh, we also see a motif that you may not think of with quote unquote Viking literature, 
which is this sort of uh, idea we associate with later chivalric uh, literature, uh, like the, you know, the courtly knights who are gonna protect the weak and only fight the strong. But it's actually a, a much older idea. Uh, you don't wanna be seen as fighting someone who's weaker than you, and Bodvar reminds Hrolf's men of that when they're picking on Hot, uh, who eventually becomes uh, Hjalti. Uh, you know, he, he says frequently that this is just unbecoming behavior, picking on someone who's smaller than you. So uh, he tells his brother Elgfrothi this too. You shouldn't go raiding, you shouldn't go uh, attacking people on the, the highways and, and taking what doesn't belong to you just because you're stronger than them. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's against fighting, it means he's, he wants to punch up. You know, always fight somebody who's as strong or stronger than you. Um, and when the, the berserks come into King Rolf's court, you know, Bodvar has no problem fighting them but uh, he, he with, uh, he'll wait uh, when it's uh, unclear whether the person who's taunting him is actually stronger than him or not. He'll try to put off the fight uh, in, in those cases. And we see this, we see Bodvar really stand up for this idea by protecting this character named Hot. Now, f obviously, uh, first he knows of Hot because he stops at Hot's parents' uh, uh, cottage. They're these you know, peasants, and uh, they, show hospitality to Bodvar, and they tell him, if you go to Hlidar, which is King Rolf's uh, uh, mead hall, this, um, uh, this large, you know, this is before there are nation states and before there are really wealthy kingdoms. They don't have palaces, they don't have large cities, uh, it, the, the sort you would find in, in Southern Europe at this time, even the sort you, the sort you would find in Southern Europe during the, the Bronze Age. You know, there's nothing like the city of Troy or the city of Mycenae uh, in the north. Uh, the the most opulent you're going to get is a uh, relatively large village, which might just be a few hundred, maybe a thousand or so people. Uh, and at the center of it is going to be this longhouse, this uh, really high-roofed, uh, long building that is big enough to uh, bring in the, uh, the the warriors that are loyal to the king, and then the uh, people who serve the king, and the people who are part of the royal family and the warriors' families. But when Bodvar comes there, you know, he sees this kid that he's been told about uh, building this uh, wall of bones when uh, the warriors are eating uh, meat off the bone and they throw the bone at hot and uh, you know, he's got bruises all over his body and so the, he, he can't stand up for himself. The, the most he can do is try to build a wall out of these bones. And um, the fact that people are doing this is showing, uh, shows us that uh, Hrolf's, uh, warriors are not yet the champions that they need to be. They're these sort of bullies. And uh, Bodvar is gonna put a stop to that and when somebody th decides to throw a bone at him, he grabs the bone, throws it back, and, and kills the guy when it, when it hits him. Uh, and you notice uh, King Rolf's response to that is, well, you've killed one of my men and you know what the guy was doing was really dishonorable, so I, I understand why you did it, but now I, I'm missing a warrior. Will you take his place? And of course that was, um, Bodvar's goal to begin with. But I really like the story of Hot. I really like the uh, sort of zero to hero uh, aspect of his story because he's not only small, he's also a complete coward. And it's, uh, he's the one that Bodvar is clearly decides to be a mentor uh, with. He doesn't just defend him by throwing the bone at the guy uh, who had been throwing bones at Hot, but then he drags him out when this, uh, the sort of dragon troll creature uh, attacks Lidar. Uh, he drags him out there and of course Hot thinks he's gonna be just instantly killed and there's just no chance. You know, he was afraid to stand up to the, the warriors. Of course he's afraid to stand up to this monster. But uh, Bodvar kills the, the dragon, uh, but then he makes Hot uh, drink the, the dragon's blood and all of a sudden he turns into just this completely different uh, sort of uh, hero. Uh, he's now, uh, he will later earn the name uh, Hjalti, which means the uh, the hilt, the hilt of the sword. So, uh, you know, uh, he's the uh, the hilt of, of King Hrolf's uh, sword. He becomes known as Hjalti the Magnanimous because he's, you know, forgiven the people who've been uh, torturing him. But this act of drinking the dragon's blood is another uh, motif that really connects this saga to much, much older beliefs, uh, uh, apparently. And we've seen this elsewhere in Hrolf's saga. So right from the beginning of Bodvar's narrative, we have the, the story of his father, Bjorn, 
uh, who is, you know, uh, Vit, this uh, a woman uh, who practices this sort of shamanic magic, uh, hits him with a, a wolfskin glove and it makes him turn into a bear during the day. Well, he tells his wife, Bera, that when men kill me tomorrow, they're gonna uh, try to make you eat part of my flesh. Don't do it because it will have uh, effects on our, our children, uh, because he knows that uh, she's pregnant with their three sons. But this prohibition against eating that bear flesh uh, seemed violating that, even though Bear doesn't want to. Vit makes her do this, and it seems that Vit is doing this deliberately. She wants uh, to force Bear to eat this bear flesh so that something's going to happen to her children. And this seems to be why uh, Elgfrothi has the bottom half of, a, of an elk, and why Thorir Houndsfoot has you know, this, uh, you know, these dog's paws on the front part of his feet. Uh, and they've got this sort of quasi-animal nature because their mother, while she was pregnant, ate part of this bear's flesh. So eating the, the flesh of particular types of uh, animals, especially supernatural animals, will, will change the sort of type of person you are. Uh, there again, when Bodvar is leaving Norway, he stops by Elgfrodi's uh, hut, and Elgfrodi uh, wrestles around with him and, see, and says that you're not quite as strong as you should be, uh, so he cuts his own, Elfrothi cuts his own leg and takes the blood and has Bodvar drink it. And as soon as Bodvar drinks it, he's much stronger. Then Elfrothi pushes him, Bodvar doesn't move, and something has changed. Uh, but then the, the biggest change is, is, of course, when Hot turns into Hjalti uh, after drinking this dragon's blood. This happens elsewhere in, in Norse mythology. Uh, the hero Siegfried, uh, or Sigurd, uh, kills a dragon and then drinks its blood and all of a sudden he's able to understand the speech of birds and, and other animals. So whatever happens after drinking the blood of a supernatural animal it doesn't uh, always have the same effect but it has some effect. Uh, but in this case it, it is a pretty clear zero to hero effect on Hjalti. Now Hjalti's situation, you know, he goes on to join this group of, of guys, that uh, this group of champions that had been abusing him. But this whole situation tells us a lot about how the, the chiefdom worked. This is not, uh, uh, King Hroth is not a king in the sense that we think of today. He doesn't have total power, he can't just command people to do what he wants to do and they don't just automatically do it. He has to be the ring giver, he has to be uh, the, the one who deals out treasure. Uh, and that means he has to have the treasure, and, and to get the treasure he has to have the warriors to go on, on these battles to go get this treasure and bring it back. But then he's the one that redistributes it. So as long as he keeps that uh, redistribution of wealth happening, he keeps that, uh, that economic system uh, flowing, uh, he can maintain his, his central power. But if he becomes too stingy, and we'll see this in Beowulf, we'll see uh, Hrothgar warn Beowulf, don't become stingy like this, this other king uh, who be became a terrible person because he didn't share things with his, uh, with his thanes, with his warriors. Uh, this is very important. This is really the only thing keeping the chief uh, in power, keeping that king in power. Uh, but he's also got to manage the egos of his warriors. He's got, if he, if he gets the best warriors together in his hall, and in, in his, uh, his comitatus, his, his group of thanes, then that means he's gonna get a lot of guys who are used to pushing other people around, and of course they're gonna end up pushing each other around. Uh, so we see this happening when uh, all of his warriors are picking on Hot. We see this in full effect when the berserkers who are there to serve Hrolf, but serve in the sense of they're gonna go with him, fight against who he wants to fight, but in return they are expecting to be well paid. And they get, when they arrive, they start by getting right in Hrolf's face and saying, do you think you're, uh, that you could take us, that you could uh, defeat us? Um, the, the passage says, now when winter passes, and it gets round to the time when Hrolf's berserks are expected back, uh, Bodvar asks Hjalti what the berserks are like. He says that it's their custom when they come home to, uh, to this retinue to go up to each man, starting with the king, and ask him if he considers his, himself as brave as them. But then the king says, that's hard to say with such valiant men as you are, uh, who have so distinguished yourselves in battle and in bloodlettings among various peoples in the southern part of the world just as much as in the north. Uh, and the king answers them this way from courage rather than cowardliness because he recognizes their support and that they win great victories for the king and win much wealth. So they're even sort of a potential threat to the king. Uh, it's almost as if they're saying like, look, you better respect us or you know, we could easily you know, kill you right here and I don't think any of your men can do anything about it. Uh, and the king is in a really weird situation, which a later you know, high medieval king uh, would, would never be in. He would always have, uh, he would always be able to command somebody to you know, kill anyone threatening him. But 
uh, Hrolf has to be very delicate in how he responds, at least until Bodvar, uh, sort of, uh, Bodvar and, and Hjotli both uh, beat up, uh, you know, severely uh, uh, beat up uh, two of the Berserks. And Bodvar is able to establish by force this sort of uh, modesty that everyone else then adopts, this respect for the king that Bodvar has from the beginning, uh, but not all the other warriors do. We also see the role of the king as the ring giver, as the treasure giver, put to the test when um, King Hrolf goes to uh, King Adels to get his own tr uh, inheritance back. Uh, there is gold there that he's not going to steal, it's gold that he's, he deserves, but when King Adels married Hrolf's mother, Irsa, uh, he took all his inheritance and, and didn't give it to him. So when uh, Hrolf and his men go up to Uppsala, to, uh, to get that treasure back. They get it back after passing Adel's sort of magical challenges. But on their way back, uh, Irsa sends this guy named Vogue, who's a, a, a peasant, who's somebody of very little wealth, and King Rolf gives Vogue a uh, ring, and uh, Vogue's response to that is to swear a, a type of allegiance to Rolf. Now, notice Rolf hasn't asked him to swear any kind of allegiance, he just gave them a, him a gift, a gift of a golden ring. And Vogue's response to that is to swear to King Rolf that if anybody murders him, uh, he, Vogue, will uh, get revenge. So this is the same thing that uh, one of his regular warriors would be expected to do. Uh, so just by giving him a ring, that makes Vogue instantly uh, swear a type of uh, fealty uh, to this, this ring giver, uh, this chief. We also see a, a duel of uh, ring giving prowess between uh, Rolf and King Adels on the, the escape from Uppsala, on the Ferris Plains, or the Ferris Valor. Uh, when Rolf sees that someone has left a ring on the ground, he refuses to pick it up because he knows it's there to stall him. So he just throws another ring down there to show, I'm not the one who receives rings, I'm the one who deals them out and he has more treasure you know, thrown down in the field, and it's because of that that Adel's men, who are supposed to get their treasure from King Adel's, they're actually stopping to pick up Hrolf's treasure. In other words, they're you know, inadvertently and unconsciously uh, switching allegiances, and so while they're stopping to pick up Hrolf's treasure that's on the ground, uh, they're no longer uh, fighting on uh, King Adel's behalf, and even Adel's himself reaches over to uh, pick up uh, his favorite ring that's been taken. He sees it there on the ground. Of course, Rolf is the one that threw it on the ground. Adels reaches to pick it up, and that's when he gets you know, cut on the backside uh, by, by King Rolf, because now he is sort of, in picking up that ring, he is now essentially bowed to King Rolf. So uh, Rolf has, has thoroughly embarrassed him and sort of outperformed him as a ring-giving chief. And because it's this uh, this whole comitatus, this, this war band that's uh, held together by this chief, uh, is held together by this chief's dispensation of wealth. Uh, this is why uh, this uh, sort of hall of champions is, is able to be uh, formed at Lidar uh, around King Rolf. And this seems to be what attracts Bodvar. Now remember, Bodvar could have stayed uh, and inherited the the rule of that part of Norway from his grandfather, King Ring, but he refuses. He then goes to the land of the Gauls, where his brother, Thorir Houndsfoot, has become king, and Thorir says, you know, I'll give you all this wealth and give you a, you know, half the kingdom, uh, but uh, uh, Bodvar doesn't, doesn't want that. What Bodvar wants is to be part of this hall of champions, to be part of King Rolf's champions, and that's why he goes all the way to, to Flydar. The same thing, if you go back and read the story of Svipdag and his brothers, this is what attracts them to, to this. And this is, is part of that, uh, that drive. It's not just a drive for uh, a fortune, uh, to, to borrow the uh, Indiana Jones phrase, it's fortune and glory. Uh, or it's you know wealth, but not just wealth, it's wealth and chaos. You've gotta get that wealth by fighting for it, uh, by earning it. Of course, we might say that that's stealing it, rather than earning it by our modern uh, uh, mores, and you know, that's, that's probably best. But at this time, we see that uh, wealth that's uh, won in battle is better than wealth that's just given to you. And this hall and this group of champions uh, is one of the reasons that Hlydar is going to be remembered. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you when we read Beowulf, Hlydar is Heorot. Uh, I, I mentioned already that Hrolf is uh, referred to as Hrothulf in Beowulf, and uh, 
the Hroth Elf we see in Beowulf is much younger than King Hroth. But uh, Hroth or Hrothulf is a, a Skjoldung king in, in Old Norse, when these are the shieldings in Beowulf. Uh, but uh, Hrothgar in Beowulf is also a shielding. He's uh, Hrolf's uncle. Uh, in this saga, in Hrolf's saga, uh, uh, Hrothgar corresponds to a guy named Hror. If you just drop the, the TH in both Hrothulf, you get Rolf, and uh, Hrothgar, you get Hror. Uh, he's actually a king in uh, Northumberland in England, uh, which is, uh, a Danish settlement uh, later on. But the hall at, uh, th this magnificent hall that uh, King Rolf uh, is, uh, rules over, has all his champions in, this is the same as Heorot in Beowulf. And you'll see that uh, it has something in common with the city of Troy. Notice that to get from the North Sea on the left of this map to the Baltic Sea on the right, you have to go past the uh, island of Zealand, and this is where uh, uh, Hlidar is, and this seems to be why it's such a strategically important and therefore wealthy place. Anybody who goes past there kind of has to uh, pay homage to uh, whoever rules that island, and that island is being ruled from Hlidar or Herorot, uh, this, this central uh, uh, mead hall. One more theme you may have noticed is, uh, I believe your translation actually uses the word Yule, uh, Yule is a Norse word, so when we say, you know, Yuletide in reference to Christmas, uh, that is that time of year. It's around the solstice, shortly after it. Uh, and this uh, celebration, celebration may not exactly be the right word, uh, we still have references to the Yule log, this giant log that should burn for days. Uh, uh, being used at this point. Uh, keep in mind, in these northern latitudes, this is the darkest time of the year, and the sun, uh, may, depending how far north you are, may not come out at all uh, during the day, uh, regardless of whether there's clouds or not. It's uh, you know uh, far enough north that you get uh, entirely dark days. And so this is a very cold time of the year, very difficult time of the year, but it's also a very scary time of the year because it's dark outside all the time. And so we may love Christmas and say it's the most wonderful time of the year, but Yule to, to the Norse, especially the pre-Christian Norse, is not the most wonderful time of the year. In fact, it's the scariest time of the year. That's when the dark side of, uh, you know, the, the powers of darkness uh, are the strongest. And you may have noticed every time something bad happens that Bodvar or somebody else has to um, contend with, uh, it's at Yule. So this dragon troll thing attacks at Yule. Uh, the, the berserkers come home at Yule. Uh, in other words, even these, these you know, bad guys who are willing to fight a anybody, they kind of want to come, come in and uh, you know, stay inside, apparently, uh, at Yule, but then that also means trouble for everybody else. So there's sort of this domino effect of the, the, the problems in the darkness outside. Uh, so Yule is a very sort of touchy time, a very sort of um, uh, frightening time. And this is also the time when Skuld and her sort of undead army and her army of these you know, evil magic creatures, uh, the, these warriors that you can kill and they just get right back up again, uh, they're, uh, they have to attack at Yule because this is when her power, her evil power is the strongest. Uh, we're gonna see this again with Gretter's saga. Uh, every time something you know, dark and supernatural happens, it's gonna be at Yule. Now there's some more readings that I want to I want you to read uh, on the schedule before we get to Beowulf, but I want you to keep some some things in mind from uh, Hroth's saga, especially the the parts about uh, uh, Bodvar uh, that I want you to keep in mind when you read Beowulf. Remember that Bjarki means little bear, Beowulf means bee wolf. Remember that Hlidar is the same as Hirorot. Um, uh, and remember that Hroth is actually present in the poem of Beowulf. His his name is Hrothulf. Uh, but when it comes to creatures attacking uh, Hlidar, Herorot, look and see what similarities you, uh, we, we might have. And we'll see more of these building up in this Bear's Son narrative. Uh, they'll sort of collect. Now, there, clearly there are gonna be differences. Anytime we compare uh, one narrative to another, we don't wanna just say, hey, look, these two things seem to be parallel, they seem to be similar. Uh, once we identify those similarities, we then want to say, okay, well, what's different and why is it different? Why are those differences now sort of uh, become more important once we've identified some of these similarities. In other words, it could have been more similar, why isn't it 
uh, more similar. Uh, what are these two cultures, uh, how do they differ? Uh, what uh, different ideas about how things work and, and what's important in a narrative uh, do we have in, in, in one text, the text that produces the, uh, the saga of Rolf Kroki versus the uh, culture that produces the poem of Beowulf. Uh, keep in mind both the similarities and the differences as you read uh, Beowulf.